and the Pulse of History. Rhonda, welcome to Pandemonium U. Thank you, Pamela. I'm really happy to join you and Simon and to talk to you about Chanel today and to see all these great people from all over the world joining us. Hello. Yeah. Um, the, Rhonda, when you, we both came on a few minutes ago, you noticed that we were both wearing black and black glasses and uh, we're dressed almost identically. And you said that that is in fact, thanks to Coco Chanel probably. In fact, that's true. And I usually say when I address a group of people, many women, as there probably are in the audience today, that if we look around, we see an after image of Coco Chanel every time. And today, you and I, wearing black as a normal part of everyday clothing, that was something Chanel popularized that had been simply for mourning, would never have been what ladies wore socially, to wear our eyeglasses, big, bold, black eyeglasses, not with shame or embarrassment, but as a fashion accessory is also, again, thanks to Coco, who was who had terrible vision. Um, I, I have had the experience of putting on her actual glasses and the world went crazy blur. Um, her myopia became a, a fashion statement early on, <laughs> she realized. So pre-Chanel women with terrible eyesight or just mediocre eyesight went around not seeing any crashed into a lot of things. Um, you know, what women had lorgnettes, of course there were spectacles, but it was considered a very embarrassing thing to wear and they would put them on, take them off, put them on, take them off. Chanel popularized fashion statement glasses. Wow. Um, so just as a kind of overview of your book and then we'll get to a little bit of the chronology, what drove you to write a book about Coco Chanel? It's a big topic. A lot had been written about it already. What, what made you want to do it? Well, you're right. When I started my biography, there were, at my count, um, 77 at least extant biographies of Coco Chanel in languages all over the world. Um, but I was convinced no one had approached it from the angle that interested me. Um, I study theater and performance. I write about spectacle. And I had begun to write a book at a, with a much more narrow focus about Chanel as a costume designer for ballet, stage, and film, which she did for 30 years and no one really had talked about. So I was fascinated by that. But as I researched it, I realized that she was indeed a costume designer, but for the entire globe, and that we were all nearly a century on, more than a century on, costumed by, and more importantly, as, Coco Chanel. And so this exploded as a book about the theater of the globe that she was costuming. Um, well, let, let's kind of start at the beginning and go back in time. Coco Ch Chanel, who was called Gabrielle at the beginning, was born in the Loire region of France. She had uh, an incredibly bleak childhood that you write about. Um, her mother died um, when she was very ill. Her, her father was sort of an itinerant peddler who her mother was always chasing after and yes. uh, wasn't at home. The mother kept falling pregnant again. She, then the father would leave again. The mother, the, there's a lot of drama. The mother died. And then Coco Chanel's father kind of rejected the children. And that's um, not to get too psychoanalytical too early on, but that act, that rejection kind of marked her for the rest of her life and defined her. Correct. Um, the death of her mother when she was 11 was obviously a tragedy, but a far greater compounding tragedy was mere days afterward. Chanel herself was 11. There were five children in the family. Her father came back, um, buried his wife, and carted the girl children, the three sisters, off to a convent orphanage where he left them with the sisters and never returned. He never returned. And the girls waited for him, expected him back. And you know, gradually it dawned on them that they would never see their last, their remaining parent again. The, the depth of that abandonment, the cruelty, the desolation was by far the, the greatest tragedy. So this is this is the actual orphanage that she was in. Yes. It's Wait. beautiful from a distance, but imagine being inside it. It was actually quite spectacular in some ways, but it was a heavy, dark, windowless place and she spent um, about seven years there. Um, and But while she was there uh, amid the austerity, she read this French writer who I had actually never heard of before, but I'm sure is incredibly well known, De Courcel. Yes, Pierre De Courcel. Uh, I don't know how well known he is uh, apart from people who study the pop culture of the 19th century. 
Um, but I knew that Chanel was fascinated by these sort of um, melodrama novels that she would read with the other teenage girls, you know, under the covers. This was not the sort of thing the nuns would approve, but I decided to read all of his books myself to find out what got into the head of adolescent Gabrielle. And what I discovered was that they were rags to riches stories about often, you know, destitute or unwanted young women who magically ascended to glamorous living through marriage or lovers or uh, fashionable uh, turns of events in their lives. And I realized the story of her life, or at least the story she recounted for so many years of her life, could have been lifted right out of one of these de Courcel novels. But she um, she managed she managed famously managed to to do this, and she was very much influenced in a surprising way by the nuns and the organization of the uh, of that that she saw there. What was it about the nuns that had an influence on her later life and her fashion? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this is largely my interpretation because she rarely spoke too much. She never actually admitted that she lived in a convent orphanage. She, she, there were moments where she would forget and mention it, um, but it's, it's well known. The nuns in the late 19th century, the sisters that she was living with would have been among the only women of that region who were literate, who were educated, who had positions of responsibility. Essentially, it was an all woman run organization. And Chanel grew up, her own mother had been, as you pointed out, um, a very sad and um, rather desperate woman who had to chase after her itinerant husband who was unfaithful and rather cruel. And had she had been very poor and um, orphaned herself as a girl. So Chanel had only seen women who were destitute, desperate, repeatedly pregnant, um, dependent on men until she got to Aubazine, where she met women who had no affiliation with men in their personal lives, who ran a school and a home for young girls, who dressed simply and in her mind elegantly, all in black. In black. They wore black. Of course they wore black, and they had chain link belts on which they would hold their keys. And she did speak about the nun belts and the keys, and of course the crucifixes that they wore. Um, and this kind of dour simplicity um, marked her very much. And she found great beauty and solace in it. And it later came out in her designs, of course. And the atmosphere that she was raised in and the kind of social milieu was, it was nationalistic. Uh, it would have been uh, quite anti-Semitic quite reverential about um, social class and um, uh, reverential about the aristocracy. Can you tell us a little bit more about the social milieu that, that she would have been brought up in? Well, um, it was a time when um, aristocracy and royalty were uh, still accepted as uh, among the nuns that she lived with. I'd done some research into the particulars of that um, sect and the um, area that she grew up in, it was extremely conservative, it was extremely Catholic, it was extremely, as you say, nationalistic about France and native Frenchness, francité, in the sense of an almost racial, biological sense. Um, and she would have absorbed that even before she knew what it was. Um, a good deal of anti-Semitism, absolutely, and other forms of racism and deep, deep classism. Classism isn't even the right word because it suggests an awareness. It was just a sort of enracinated feeling of the way God created everything. Um, a hierarchy, a ladder of life. Um, but at, at the same time, a, a sense of inferiority in, in Coco because she was at the bottom of that ladder because she was poor. Absolutely. But the difference for her, I think one of the things that marked her early on as someone who would try to change that world is that she couldn't accept it. She, I think, felt different even from early childhood. And while she absorbed the hierarchical aspects, she resisted the notion that she belonged at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, I think she, you know, like many sort of geniuses, I think she had a sense of her talents, even though she didn't have much to express them with. She did love singing in the uh, choir. She knew that she had some sort of performing nature. And I do think the novels that she read sparked something in her that was already present, a sense of being anointed almost, of, of 
being able to ascend given half a chance. And then she really clawed her way out. So she, um, she worked in as a performer for a while, but she was also, she learned to be a seamstress and her mother had been a seamstress too. So clothing always played a role in, in her life. And that was the skill set she acquired. Yes, um, it was what the nuns taught the girls. Um, that was considered a very important skill for a girl to marry with you know, um, homemaking uh, abilities, a prime among them, sewing, although she didn't know fancy sewing. She actually had an aunt whom she did visit sometimes outside of the convent who was good at um, making hats and sewing sort of frilly things. And it seems as though on certain occasions she learned some more deft uh, abilities from that aunt and some cousins. Um, but yes, she learned that and she, um, when she got out of her childhood orphanage and in a, a pension she lived in shortly after that, she began working, um, repairing soldiers' uniforms while trying to make it as a cafe concert singer in local cabarets. You're muted, Pamela. Uh, this is a picture um, that you have in, in the book as well, um, just showing, yeah, uh, just showing the typical fashion of the day, just to give a sense of what she didn't like or what she was well, rebelling against. Yes, this is a rather spectacular dress, it, it, you know, by Char the great Charles Worth. But yes, this is an example of the kind of flourishes and bigness and elaborate dress that was common. So in, in 1900, Chanel was 17, and this is what a grand lady might wear. Okay, and here we have. If I can change the page. Uh, not so long afterwards, Chanel, uh, with her interpretation of what a woman should wear. Well, yes, um, here is Chanel on horseback with the great love of her life, the greatest love of her life, whose name was Arthur Capel, or Boy, as he was in Boy Capel, um, whom she took up with. And he was a polo player, a tennis player, a sportsman, British. And she began cadging his uh, objects from his wardrobe and she found that she looked terrific in men's clothing, especially sports clothing. And here she is borrowing some of his, she had a very boyish figure, which again, at that time was not considered an attractive quality. She was flat chested, she was slim hipped, she was um, sort of bony and um, athletic. And she looked great in men's clothes. Now we think of that as the fashion look, but back then you wanted a, someone, you know, bien en chair with voluptuousness and the gowns highlighted that. And she started to wear her hair short and she would get a suntan, which was not at all fashionable then. Yes, she loved being outdoors, but also a suntan um, was considered a sign of peasant labor. The only white ladies who would um, have sun darkened skin were out in the fields picking vegetables. And so nobody wanted to look that way. If they were um, upper class, they carried parasols. Chanel decided, Chanel was, um, she had olive skin and uh, dark hair and eyes, which she got from her father's side of the family. So she tanned rapidly and well, and she figured out that this suited her. And because of her eventual great influence, women uh, who before had been running from the sun were sunbathing on the beaches of France to look more like Coco. And how did she get started in, in business and in the fashion business? It's a fascinating, almost incredible story. Um, when she found her first um, boyfriends, it really started with exposure to the aristocracy through men she met in the town where she was working. First, she began uh, living as a kind of courtesan with one aristocrat, Etienne Balsan, and then she met Arthur. What does that mean as a kind of courtesan? Is that <laughs> a euphemism? The term at the time was, was even better than that. She was what they call an irrégulière, an irregular woman. Um, by which means obviously someone outside of the bounds of, of conventional morals, but aristocratic men, you know, for centuries had lovers who were their mistresses and she uh, was uh, attractive and made herself visible around town. And she was sort of picked out by uh, one aristocratic man as being adorable and quirkily interesting. This was not Capel, but this other gentleman who brought her into his chateau where a number of such ladies lived or sometimes visited, including some quite famous courtesans who were also women of the stage. Um, Emilienne d'Alençon was one of them who became quite famous. Anyway, Chanel um, 
didn't have any clothes of her own to wear among these grand ladies. She didn't have money. What she had was style and she began wearing the men's clothes. And these very ornate other courtesans looked at her and thought, wow, that, that's very chic. Make some for us. And she started with hats. She started making sort of little straw boater hats for women. Again, something that men wore, not women. And her lovers um, introduced her to more irregular women who started imitating her fashion. She started making hats. And then ultimately her great love, Boy Capel, gave her a loan to start her own boutique and got her sewing lessons so that she would learn more. Is that what we're seeing in these pictures here? Well, this some is the early picture. designs. These are some of her earliest, most successful designs, although she'd been at it for a while. By this point, she's um, 34, which because Chanel always looks so young, it's always hard to believe the age she was when she did things. She lived a very long life. Um, by 1917, she had really become quite well known through the invention of what you're seeing here, these Jersey separates. Now, it's hard to, it's hard to overstate how radical this look was. Jersey was a fabric only used for men's underwear in this era. So imagine aristocratic ladies discarding gowns like the one you just showed of um, you Charles Worth with all the silk and the, and the lace and the corsets and so forth, and instead wearing outfits made of material their husband's underwear was made of. But, but if she worshiped the aristocracy, why did she want to change it so much? Well, that's a great question, um, two reasons. Worship is often the flip side of hostility, right? Um, and while Chanel yearned, desperately yearned to elevate herself socially, she had tremendous rage against the upper class, a real rage against the social hierarchy, quite justifiably. And so to me, the success of Chanel's design vision is the greatest revenge story in, in fashion history because, well, and then there's just exigency. She didn't have the money to create clothes of expensive materials, neither for herself nor for others. She found bolts of Jersey and got them for a song from a fabricant. And then she just made the simplest clothes in the world, Jersey tube dresses, those um, outfits that you saw, which were really just simple belted um, loose jackets with loose flowing bottoms. They were easy to sew, they were easy to reproduce, but it was also a modern moment of more reproducible, more uniform clothing. And the women of the time who were, you know, it was, we were, we're talking about World War I, we're talking about an era of shortages, of grief, um, and her little sailor jersey outfits, I think were very resonant with both the moment for social mobility, grief, because these were um, women who were thinking of the many men, the sailors who were dying, they were sailor suits. To me, they were sort of, again, an after image of something in people's minds. They were made of available materials and they felt good. They felt light and free. And this was a new feeling for women in their clothes. So they kind of took off. It was like wearing, it was like now, it's like the way we feel now wearing our sweats all the time. I've been thinking back to the era when Chanel said, hey, you can wear these Jersey floaty things and be chic. I think we're having a moment like that now. Interesting. And, and you mentioned this was World War I because um, she was also very interested in the way m soldiers dressed. And she, she had a very was. strong, all her life, military influence. She was influenced from the very earliest when she was a seamstress uh, sewing soldiers' uniforms. She was you know, touching, learning, feeling the construction of soldiers' uniforms. But also she had an androgynous quality to her. She loved men's clothes. She always admired the ease with which men could run and move and, and, and do sports without being held back by their clothing. So this, what we're seeing here is a version. This is actually a recreation by Lagerfeld, by Karl Lagerfeld of the 1917 sailor suit. And I love looking at the back, Pamela, because if you see that placket that, that falls down, that isn't keeping with what the soldiers would wear, um, the Navy, um, the sailors. But try to think of it animated by a current of air, by a breeze. It gives a lightness to the body, a movement, a freeness, a, a kind of dance um, that she was mindful of. So she sculpted clothes simply, but with an eye always towards 
mobility, not just of the woman within, but the clothes themselves. There's an airiness to this. It's, it's got a simple beauty. Um, you, you have an interesting quote in your book from the historian Eric Hobsbawm. He says, mm -hmm. brilliant fashion designers, a notoriously non-analytic breed, sometimes succeed in anticipating the shape of things to come better than professional predictors. And she seems to have this genius for kind of feeling the, the, the vibrations of the tracks before other people. Uh, I, I love that remark by Hobsbawm. I believe in something I call the sartorial unconscious. I think that fashion often speaks a very deep sort of dreamscape of the culture. And then there are people, I, I, I do believe Chanel had a unique genius, but she was not alone in feeling this moment at the time of mobility for women, of new freedoms for women. And I think that if we look at what her revolution created, it is in step with a kind of gra growing liberation of women. And war with all its tragedy also often brings mobility for different social classes and for women. That's a really good point. Um, I'm, I want to bring up the logo because that uh, happened soon afterward. This was very, her double C's were very new that she invented in 1921. Yes. Um, many people speculate, we don't know, um, that the C's were not just for her name, Coco and Chanel, but might have been a kind of wistful uh, embrace of her name, Chanel, with that of her lover, Capel. In any case, what was really, this was after their love affair that she designed this logo. What was radical about a logo was that at the time, the idea of a designer imprinting her initials on a customer was unheard of and really unthinkable. There, even the concept designer was barely thinkable. What she was in many people's minds still and in the social parlance of the time was a seamstress. That is a working person you rely on like the person who brings fish to your kitchen. You do not wear that person's initials. People, women wore initials, their own embroidered on their trousseau. Initials were, initials remain to even today, the most intimate thing. It's, it's your own letters that you use to embellish your own possessions. The idea of someone else putting her name on you as a point of pride for you. Uh -huh. We think that's normal now in a world where everyone is covered with G's and C's and, you know, and- And you stay in the Trump hotel and eat the Trump steak. And I, I mean, there's a certain I narcissism. Just in the to <laughs> not, not to mention the, the T word, but I mean, there is a certain narcissism apparent in the act of her sort of wanting to brand everyone else with her own name. Narcissism, and again, this is the revenge rage. Um, she did not have a family crest of arms. She did not have a trousseau. Young ladies of a certain social class would have beautiful linens and, and bed clothes that were embellished with embroidered initials that they would learn to embroider in preparation for their marriage. She never married, nor did she have a trousseau, nor did she have a family name that she could, in her mind, be proud of. So again, this sort of amazing revenge reverse strategy once she became well known and, and well off, she just simply stamped her name and continues to stamp her name on pretty much half the globe. And people will pay thousands and thousands of dollars for the privilege of wearing her name. It's a such, it's a, it's a, I said narcissism, but there's, there's genius in, in all this inventiveness as well. And then her next step was also very interesting because she realized she could go into perfume and brand the way people smell. Perfume was the single most important part of the business model that Chanel followed. And it's not entirely her invention. That is to say, she was approached by the Wertheimer brothers who recognized in her, she was introduced to Pierre and Paul Wertheimer and the Wertheimer family still owns the Chanel company. Um, Pierre and Paul were already um, very successful business people. They owned bourgeois cosmetics, which still exist, by the way. And, other, and so she was introduced to them and they saw in her a brilliant avatar for a large brand. And she had been working and she wanted to create a perfume. And with the Wertheimers, she was able to create what transformed the perfume industry and was the sort of the signature thing that 
wafted her influence around the world because it remains the most accessible price point. Anyone who is interested in Chanel could perhaps save up for a bottle of Chanel number no. five, even right. if- And Chanel number no. five was the first scent she invented that was invented for her, at least, in, in, well, in she worked on in it. 1921. It, yes, she worked on the scent in uh, conjunction with a man named Ernst Bo, who had been the perfumer to the royal court of Russia, to the imperial czars. And so he was one of the world's greatest noses, as they say, but she apparently had a pretty good sense of scent herself. And she worked in the lab with um, Ernst for a long time until they settled on the fragrance that she wanted, which would be unlike any other fragrance ever created to that date. Um, in that it did not smell like a particular flower. It did not smell like a particular um, oil. Instead, she wanted it to smell clean and modern like her. And she didn't want to name it. Perfumes at the time were named with these fantastical romantic names like Knight of Shahrazad and Arabian Princess. And she called hers number five. No, but the idea that a woman's perfume would be named with a number, the most austere, unfancy, unglamorous thing, that was shocking. But she thought it sounded scientific. And it was, as we know, ragingly successful and made her the equivalent of a billionaire. Wow, It even though early on she sort of lost control of the perfume company, she owned just 10% of it. She owned, the deal she struck with the Wertheimers was not particularly um, equitable, let's say. Um, she only owned a small percentage of the proceeds. Even so, even so, she, um, to this day, they tell me at the Maison Chanel that every three seconds, a bottle of Chanel number no. five is sold. Every three seconds, at least one. Um, and it never, never really slowed down. I, I wanna get um, back a little bit to Chanel's personal life, which was um, <coughs> developing along the same lines. Um, tell us about her relationship with the Duke of Westminster. Well, the Duke of Westminster, um, was at the time considered possibly the richest man in the world, in the world. And Chanel started um, romance with him when she was um, close to 40 and, and thereafter. Um, he was a rabid conservative nationalist, I do believe quite anti-Semitic. Um, he lived in a, uh, an estate of such outstanding hugeness and splendor and over the top um, ornate lavishness. Chanel moved right on in and he, um, by the way, he was not her patron. She already was independently wealthy. She very much wanted to marry the Duke because she would have become a duchess and she really aspired to this life of aristocratic Ease, although she never stopped working. Um, this is them at a, at a horse race or? Yes, I, this is at, um, not Ascot, I'm not sure, maybe Ascot. He was a great um, sportsman also, and she was very influenced by his wardrobe as well. And she, during the period she was with the Duke, she began incorporating um, British tweeds into her uh, work. And she found a factory and she created unique and beautiful tweed um, uh, colors. She started uh, playing more tennis and she incorporated tennis clothes into her fashion. She wanted very much to marry the Duke, although I don't know that it was a great love affair like some of her earlier um, relationships, but she wanted that imprimatur of upper class perfection. And the Duke wanted an heir. And she tried very hard to bear him a child. Even though they weren't married, she assumed that he would marry her if she could bear him a, a child. And sadly, that did not happen, and they broke it off. But um, she remained very addressed to him in her mind. I think that she was she was hurt that he would not marry her. He quickly married a woman of his own social class right after their love affair. So let's move on to the war, um, Chanel. Uh, I want to I want you to talk about this. this is the, obviously the most controversial period of of Chanel's life. Um, she had to close her workshops, her clothing workshops during the war, but she kept her perfume business open yes. and the brothers who owned the perfume business were Jews and had yes. to leave 
France. And she tried to, under the anti-Semitic laws in France, claim ownership of the business then, use, use the moment to sort of swoop in and take it away from them. Yes, that is true. And it's one of the many ignoble things that she was involved in during World War II. Um, she did not succeed in wresting control from the Wertheimers. Um, the Wertheimers outsmarted her in a complicated move that I doubt we have time for me to explain here, but involved getting a Gentile friend of theirs to buy up their shares of stock and so forth. Um, that said, I have to tell you that some research I've done, and I, I cannot attest to the veracity of this, suggests that it's possible Chanel and the Wertheimers were in cahoots to stage this attempt to take their business away because otherwise it might've been suspicious for them to continue owning it. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it is, it is unmistakably true that she remained friendly with them even after their terrible feud over this. And she had an on again, off again affair with one of the two brothers. And that later after the war, they made um, common cause again, and they continued to support her and um, you know, subsidize her, her brand up until her death. And even now they still are the sole owners. It is a privately owned company. The descendants of the original. The descendants, yes, those brothers are long gone, of course. Right. Um, and she also during the war had a love affair with a Nazi officer who was stationed, a German officer who was stationed in Paris. And in fact, they moved into the Ritz together. She was already living at the Ritz Hotel on the Place Vendôme and they lived there together. Yes, um, the Baron von Dinklage was her lover during the war, also known as Spatz. Um, Chanel lived at the Ritz for many years before the war, during and after the war. Um, she had an apartment at the Ritz and the Ritz was then taken over, commandeered by the Nazi officers, by the elite officers of the Nazi, um, uh, of the Nazis during the occupation of Paris. Chanel managed to keep her apartment even as all the other apartments at the Ritz were taken over by the Nazis. The Baron von Dinklage essentially moved in with her uh, into her apartment and um, she socialized with him and the Nazi collaborators who were among um, some of Paris's elite. You know, we have to remember that it was not only one person's decision. There's a, a great book by the um, historian Frederick Spots called an, an, a, The Shameful Peace, A Shameful Peace, which is about just how much collaboration happened in France, in Paris, under the Nazi occupation. It's a, it's a very gray zone, as you know. Um, but there, there is some talk that she was actually a, a German spy, that she had the code name Westminster, a reference to her love affair with the Duke of Westminster. Yes, Do you buy that? No, that's true. Um, um, a spy is sort of a, not quite the right term that elevates her. She wouldn't have been qualified to be a spy actually, but she was a friend of the um, Germans and she did do work for them. I have seen the documents, it is the truth. She did go by the code name Westminster. And that is partly because she was known to travel in certain circles. The Nazis, the, the most elite Nazi operations involved often recruiting high level French celebrities, well-known people who could circulate easily and um, do their bidding. And Chanel was thrilled by this. She, the Baron von Dinklage was much younger than she. She later said, how can you blame me for having a love affair with a younger man at my age? Why would I look at his passport? She said to explain this love affair. Um, but I do think that um, von Dinklage was cultivating her as he was supposed to do with um, well-placed French people. And she did go on at least one rather badly arranged mission to try to broker a separate peace uh, for the end of World War II, which you know, went south, she didn't manage it, but she seemed eager to do it. And I also, I did a lot of archival research, which suggested very strongly, I have seen the documents that suggest that as far back as World War I, she was being watched by the French police as a possible um, operative for the Germans. So yes, she, she had, let's call it treacherous impulses. Okay, and she also had fashion impulses inspired by, this is in the lead up to the war, obviously the um, military inspired suit again. Um, and, and then you, you point out her buttons that they look like military styling buttons and, and, and that, 
what what do you make of the similarity between the double C's and the swastika? Right. Um, Chanel invented, as we said, her famous CC logo in 1921. At the time, she was involved with a, um, a Romanov Duke who was living in exile, um, czar, uh, who had been the nephew to the last czar, um, Dmitri, Grand Duke Dmitri Romanov. And it was in his company that she would have been exposed to a lot of the very early fascist sympathizers living in France. And she traveled with him to Germany where the Nazi party was sort of just beginning, the National Socialist Party. And they were inventing their own logo at the time, which is the one we all know now, the swastika, which was you know, borrowed from an ancient symbol and repurposed to, um, for, the Nazi, um, for Nazi branding. It is not only I who think that there is a distinct similarity between these symbols. And I can tell you that she was exposed to this kind of regalia very heavily in the presence of a proto fascist, the Duke, um, when she invented this logo. She also wound up very interested in embossing her logo, this sort of repurposed military symbol in some ways, on everything. She put it on shoes, on belts, on jewelry, on boxes of perfume, later makeup. Uh, we now see it everywhere and it's um, knocked off everywhere. We see it, you know, copied a billion times. To me, whether it was conscious or not, it's very much in the moment, sort of, again, this is, this is what I call the sartorial unconscious. It absorbed that zeitgeist at the, at the time of wanting a, a symbol that people could rally around. I call this era the era of logos because this is when that was born and I think we must read them together. Um, it's interesting that, you know, to read the, her wartime history because it doesn't seem like her, her, her brand is so closely associated with her and yet her brand doesn't seem to have been tainted by her wartime activity at all. Why do you think that is? Um, well, actually it was briefly. Um, at the end of World War II, Chanel was um, acknowledged as a collaborator and brought before one of the so-called purgation committees to be questioned about her collaboration activities. Most women who were found to be guilty of this most men and women were, were jailed. The women were sometimes shaved bald and paraded through the streets, humiliated publicly. None of that happened to Chanel. She, after she was arrested, she was interrogated for a few hours and let go. Within a few days, she packed up her whole home and driven into exile in Switzerland where she was able to live peacefully and undisturbed for 12 years, probably because she had special friends in high places. During that time, all of the taint that would have been associated with her collaboration activities wore off. And when she returned briefly, she did not succeed in her fashion reboot because the French remembered. But as often, America did not. <laughs> Americans are famously amnesiac and they love good fashion. And when she returned after her exile, even though the French said, well, you know, she seems tired and old and remember what she did during the war, the Americans said, welcome, we love you. And then the French quickly followed suit. So, so in the post-war period in the 1950s, after her exile in Switzerland, she comes, she does come back to France, first of all. And yeah. this is when she famously invents the tweed suit, which we have a picture um, of. Well, she had already done tweeds, but she invented um, the um, boucle suit that now is ah. synonymous with her look. So yes, we're looking at a classic example of that. Um, she had done suits for many, many years. In fact, she was perhaps one of the, if not the most famous to turn suiting into a, a feminine look. Um, she took a moment when Christian Dior had returned fashion to enormous frou-frou fur bellows and giant dresses because that was the post-war look that was popular. Um, the most, the quickest way to summon it in people's minds in America is, remember Lucy Ricardo, Lucille Ball's look in I Love Lucy. That was a very Dior inspired look, tiny waist, big skirts. Um, Chanel hated that. And she sort of inverted that look and returned us to the sleek athletic um, sporty suit and trousers that we now associate her with. Okay, and now tell us about the famous quilted bag. Yeah, um, so the quilting was something Chanel was interested in because it was what the, she was a great horse woman, horse lover, and she owned polo horses and the jockeys um, and racehorses. 
and the jockeys would have quilting in their jackets. And she borrowed this quilting for the purse that became you know, synonymous with her look, which she came out with in 54. Um, of course, we see the famous logo here, but you also see the chain strap, which was new, something that she invented for ease. Women tended to wear clutch purses. Um, Chanel loved a shoulder bag, again, to keep your hands free, to give women more of the mobility men always had. And the quilting was a sort of nod to the, um, the world of horses that she loved. And you know, the idea that now those bags are so insanely expensive that these things which were meant for simplicity and ease are now synonymous with extreme luxury, I still find somewhat funny. Um, Chanel also really liked dressing groups of women to look kind of exactly like her. <laughs> what um, was the satisfaction of this? Well, this was not her call, but this is an example of what I call the mimetic contagion, the contagion of, uh, contagion of imitation that she inspired. Chanel wound up being synonymous for a long time with what it meant to be a French woman. And in 1961, the French government asked her to provide the uniforms for the tour guides from the, for the French Expo in Moscow the um, exhibition of, of 1961 in Moscow, 130 young women from France were sent to Russia to represent France. And so how did they signal that these women represented the country, the nation of France, but to put them all in the same identical boucle beige ribbon trim Chanel suit. And this is a, a photograph of these women leaving for their trip essentially all costumed as Coco Chanel. And that's why I said at the beginning, I became fascinated to write this book when I realized we're still all costumed as Coco Chanel. And she for a long time was the sort of costumer in charge of French, Frenchness. And here she is. Um, this is Chanel in the sixties as quite an old woman with her cabine as they call it, her models. And what you see here is that they're all dressed in Chanel she required this. She required her models at the studio, even off duty, to only dress in Chanel and to dress like her. And as you see here, not only are they dressed like her, their hairstyle is like her. Um, their body language mimics hers. She essentially created a, an army of replicants and models who did not abide by these regulations, models who dressed in other clothes in her um, atelier, who did not cut their hair and wear it like her, were dismissed. She was also a kind of terrifying boss. She would have a favorite for a while and then she would cut that person off. She manipulated people to create constantly a fear in them of abandonment and, and, and desolation of the sort that she constantly felt. She projected that onto others and she um, she had a great fascination and passion for a lot of these young women and would sort of recreate almost love affair level drama with them. And she also had some female lovers. She did indeed have some female lovers. Um, not that many as far as I can tell, but she became um, more um, sapphically inclined in her elder years. <laughs> as happens to the best of us. Um, in the 1960s, the 60s happened. She hates hippies, she hates <laughs> yeah. many skirts, she thinks knees are ugly. She has this kind of modesty idea that I think maybe comes from, you say comes from her Catholic upbringing as well. Um, and, and she's much more active in America at this period. What happens to her career during the 60s? And kind of into well, the 70s? It's true that she hated, um, you know, the Mary Quant and, and um, the courage, courage is really, uh, she, she hated that sort of body bearing freedom um, of 60s fashion, even though in many ways she was the 60s influence, 60 style influence of her own era. Um, but America loved her and Americans um, saw her as a couple of things, as a conveyor of elegance. I think even to this day, American women, myself included, think of her as a sort of arbiter of French um, female elegance but it was also a sort of sporty youthful elegance. And even uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, as you see here, had a fondness for Chanel style. This is um, technically not a Chanel suit because um, the president's wife would wear an American made suit. And so this is an official line for line identical copy of the Chanel suit. And of course we all know this photograph in this day, this is the suit that uh, Jackie wore um, 
which later tragically became stained with her husband's blood and has become a real talisman, a, a kind of a token, an icon of, of a terrible moment in our history when this young, free, um, Frenchly elegant first lady was, you know, beset with terrible tragedy. Someone is asking in the chat, I'm sorry we haven't gotten to all the chat questions, about her war with Elsa Schiaparelli. Is that, would you consider it a war? Um, it was a small scale, <laughs> small scale <laughs> war. Um, Schiaparelli lived um, through the war at the same time as Chanel. Chanel called her the Italian. Um, Schiaparelli was everything Chanel was not. She was um, wild and influenced by the surrealists and created outlandish, fantastical, dream-like couture that was the exact opposite of Chanel, right? Um, the shoe on your head hat is not something that a lady who's desperate to fit in socially would wear, right? Um, a very famous uh, historian of fashion once said to me that Chanel is what you wear when you don't wanna be noticed. Scaparelli was what you would wear when you really want to stand out. And the real war, I think, in addition to the professional rivalry was that um, Scaff, as they called her, she became very, very close friends with Jean Cocteau. And Jean Cocteau was Chanel's very best friend. And Chanel felt, felt she was very susceptible to feelings of betrayal. And so the idea that Cocteau not only befriended Elsa Schiaparelli, but actually helped collaborate with her on fashion, some fascinating fashion, by the way, um, deeply wounded Coco. Um, I, I want to get back a little bit to uh, her relationships with men because she had so many of them. We have a few pictures here and she seemed to um, have this, she, she, she was obviously very charismatic and she, uh, she had her allure for men until very late in her life, even when she was a much uh, older woman. Uh, was she, was this notable at the time and, and how, how did she manage to do that? What advice do you have for um, both of us? Well, these are great photos, just to be clear, the men that you're showing she did not have love affairs with because these men would not have been uh, probably interested in ladies, but, okay. but she did have many, many love affairs with men. And um, there are men who met her when she was in her 80s who came away feeling quite young men, who came away feeling quite discountenanced and really perturbed because they felt so attracted to her even though she was an extremely elderly lady. And I have met um, people who knew her, including her close friend and stylist, Lilou Marquant, who insists that she had this uncanny ability to turn on the charm, even up until the very end of her life, in a way that few people do. She would say, look at me, count my wrinkles, she would say, I guarantee you in five minutes, you'll forget all about my age. And apparently this was true. Um, a kind of charisma that's rare. I love that. Okay, I'm gonna have to remember that. <laughs> um, so, uh, you, you know, you were writing a book about someone who famously lied about her life. I mean, lied easily and all the time. How did you, how did you figure out what was true and what wasn't true? And what was it like to write a book about someone and spend so much time in the mental space of someone who in many ways is, I mean, she's very attractive and and charismatic, but also deeply unlikable in other ways too. Oh gosh, um, that's a lot of questions. I'll start with the last one because I, I sort of thought about that the most. Coco Chanel would have really disliked me personally, I'm quite sure. And I'm not so thrilled with her either. <laughs> and when you write a biography, you become fused with this person in a very strange way. And there's space in your brain where this person just sort of sits back in an easy chair with a cigarette and just camps out indefinitely. And it's very peculiar. I tried to think about that and think about how Chanel has done that globally with her fashion and think about the effect she had on me as emblematic, and I think it was, of the effect that she managed to exercise over bill literally billions of people. She is a rare personality that imprints itself. Um, for psychological health, it's good to finish a book like that and move on. But I, I take very seriously that strange interaction that happens when you live with another person's life. In answer to the question about how you know what's true and what's false, I am a professional researcher. I'm a scholar. This was a, a book for the general public that I wrote, but I wrote it with the kind of 
scholarly archival research methods that I know from being uh, an academic. And so I spent a great deal of time, triple, quadruple, quintuply checking everything. But finally, the, the other thing I would say is, you know the old saying, you can't lie to your psychoanalyst. Chanel's law, and that's because whatever lies you try to tell are always deeply revealing anyway, right? So while there are certain things that are clearly disprovable that she would routinely say about herself, they were as interesting to me as the so-called facts because they were her dream narrative, which is what art and design is, right? And she was imposing that narrative on us. And I, I found that useful. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to just look a little bit at the current uh, impact that Chanel has in, in pop culture and in modern culture. Um, what are we seeing here? This is an art installation by a performance artist whose name is Zeus. He goes by the name Zeus and he's very mysterious. I have spoken to him on the telephone just one time and he allowed me to use this photo in my book. Um, this is from an installation he did where um, models bore um, imprints, logos of uh, intense cultural power. And to me, the most important of these was um, the Chanel logo. And as you see here, he's created a kind of evening gown of paint dripping down from the classic CC logo. I found it fascinating and I was very grateful he allowed me to use that as an example of the longevity of this image. Okay, and here are some, obviously some Chanel knockoffs, like maybe from Canal Street. Yeah, this is these are Canal Street Chanel style bags, which you can see in all cities of the world. Um, I want to you know point out that uh, often these knockoffs are produced in terrible labor conditions, very exploitative. I do not encourage people to purchase these, but it is true that they are that people are absolutely. Uh, hungry for that look everywhere at all price points. <laughs> and children too, obviously. Um, this, this young lady is the daughter of a photographer named Jamie Moore. This is her daughter, Emma. Um, Jamie Moore styles um, and photographs people in iconic personae. And this is her version of Emma in Chanel mode. And I love it to pieces. And I am grateful that Jamie let me use this photo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now we just have some celebrities wearing Chanel just to uh, see the, the, the reach of it. Yes, this is Princess Caroline of Monaco, and it's perfectly in keeping with the ongoing appeal of uh, the Chanel suit to indicate upper class, royal status, um, the wives of presidents, cabinet women, uh, senators, uh, women in power have for many, many years um, worn either Chanel or Chanel-like outfits. I, I, often uh, say that St. John suits, for example, are very much uh, in the flavor of Chanel. Okay, here's Rihanna wearing Chanel. We have Beyonce and Chanel. And what they're channeling in these uh, clothes is not just the brand, but it's also Coco herself. I do think so. I think that people, women of all types and backgrounds, are very invested in the appeal of the Coco persona, which is still to this day um, suggestive of freedom, youth, a kind of sexual glamour, uh, Frenchness that is, uh, it appears to be absolutely immortal. Um, someone is asking a good question, which is what's the story behind the pearls? What's with, what's with pearls? Oh, the pearls are a fascinating story. Um, it was Duke Dmitri Romanov who gave her a gift during their love affair of a strand of Romanov pearls, one of the few treasures he had left from the Imperial Court of Russia. He gave her the pearls and she promptly copied them in paste and wore them in huge amounts, the actual real pearls and then ropes and ropes of fake paste pearls. And she would wear them on a sweater and she would wear them to the cinema. And he was aghast because here he had given her this treasured heirloom and she turned it into a populist look where you couldn't really tell the difference between the cheapies and the Romanov pearls. And now every time we see long ropes of pearls, we think of her, but who thinks of the Romanov um, family? I don't think anyone does, <laughs> which I love, I love. Um, you you uh, had mentioned to me that you, you've given a lot of talks on Coco Chanel and often women will show up at mm -hmm. the talks wearing whatever they've, whatever Chanel they've got. All the time this happens. And I have spoken all over the country 
to groups about Chanel. And I've always been amazed at how many women want a chance to wear their favorite Chanel outfits, jewelry, shoes, bags. And sometimes I'll look out over a sea of audience members and it just confirms my feeling that the whole world is a sort of after image of this one woman's idea. Um, it just dazzles me and um, I love it and I'm fascinated by it. And do you wear Chanel? Are you, are you wearing anything no, Chanel? No, I don't. Um, for one thing, I don't have the money to buy a lot of Chanel, but, for, I, but what I do wear, as we said at the beginning of the hour, is so many things that are deeply influenced by her um, career. I wear my glasses, I love my glasses. When it's a non-pandemic era, I usually have much shorter hair. I wear black, I wear flat shoes, I wear lipstick from a tube, as you probably do too, also Chanel. Um, and the little black dress, we forgot, we haven't even had a chance to talk about. Is also I, I have a million of those and um, yes, that is her doing as well, so. Okay, Rhonda, yeah. I'm so sorry that we're running out of time and I'm very sorry we haven't had a chance to answer all questions from the audience, but those questions will be answered. I'll do a little promo in the coaching. <laughs> available from booksellers near you. It's really a fantastic read. Rhonda, thank you so much for this really fascinating conversation and presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on Pan You.